Okay, uh, I want to say something about turbulence now. Uh, you know what turbulence is. Uh, the problem is that turbulence also appears in combustion. This is a very, very old movie, probably 30 years, 22 years now. We did that long time ago, and our problem was the following. We have a flame here, fresh gases, burnt gases, and we're just sending turbulence into this flame. Um, the first thing which happens when you send turbulence, this is vorticity here, into a flame, you can see it here, is that the flame gets wrinkled. It's not, it does not remain flat. The flame starts having all these funny shapes that you can see on it here. And it gets longer, and it burns more, and you see right away also that it gets very complicated. Turbulent flows, probably you have studied them at school already, are complicated, but when you add a turbulent flow with flames, then things get really tough. And uh, when I saw that, when I was your age, I went to see my teacher, professor there, and I told him, well, I'd like to do laminar flames, okay? I, won't, I don't want to do turbulent flames because turbulent flames look very complicated. And he told me, well, it's not a problem. If you want to do laminar flames, you can study the lighter and the candle. Uh, if you want to do turbulent flames, you can study that. So I said, okay, we'll do turbulent flames anyway. Just no way you can make money on laminar flames, okay? A small amount of people do, but in practice, the real applications are all turbulent. Why are they turbulent? If you want a lot of power, you need a large flow rate if you have a large flow rate, the flow will be turbulent, so the flame will be turbulent. There's just no way out of that. So all the practical applications in combustion will be turbulent, and as you will see, the turbulence makes things interesting. This is why we get paid, actually. Of course, as you know, combustion gets hot. I've said that before. Uh, just to give you orders of magnitude here, in most flames, you have here a temperature of the fresh gases from 300 to 900 K. Why, why does it go up? Because usually we don't burn gas right away, we get it through a compressor first. So at the end of the compressor, because of compression, isentropic compression, you are hot already. The density will be of the order of one kilogram per cubic meters. And uh, at, if you're at one bar, of course, in a real engine, you will be at 20 bar, 40 bar. If you're using a diesel engine, you will be at uh, more than 100 bar. In a rocket engine also, you will be at more than 100 bar. When these things burn, you get to a second stage here, which is temperature of the order of 2000 K. And the pressure will be the same, but the density will be much less. If you just look at the state equation, if you are warm, you are light. This is why on Earth, if you do a fire, the hot gases go up, okay? It's, just, uh, it's good, actually, because if they would stay there, you would have a problem. It's actually a problem for safety in the, if you are in, the spa in space. If you have no gravity, the burn gases remain where they are which is not a good way to evacuate them. You, you, you have to push them away. The second thing which is not as known probably is that the burn gases are very viscous. You could see, when you see them, you know, in a fire, you see burn gases going up, they look like they are not viscous at all. But it's not true. Uh, the viscosity, the kinematic viscosity, nu, changes like the temperature to the power two. So typically, uh, between the viscosity in the burn gases and the viscosity in the fresh gases, you can have a ratio of 10 to 50. That means the Reynolds number in the burn gases will be much less than it is in the fresh gases. And again, you will see this has implications for turbine combustion. Okay, I've talked a lot about gas combustion. Now, gasoline, kerosene are not gas, they are liquid. So when you put gasoline in your car, you put liquid. How does that burn? Well, you need to atomize this thing. And this adds a new dimension to the field of combustion now. We have to care about the following problem. How do we inject the gasoline into the engine? You know, you cannot just take uh, the gasoline and put it in your cylinder. It won't work. Uh, the important thing is you need to atomize it first. And once it's atomized, it, that means broken into small droplets, these droplets will go into the chamber. They will evaporate. They will go to gas. And when they are in, in gas, then we are back to the previous problem. We have to burn gas with air. The problem is that uh, to do that, to atomize the droplets and to vaporize them, it's quite, it's quite complicated. And uh, most of you probably here are using uh, diesel engines. Uh, the main progress in diesel engines in the last 10 years is something we did on the atomization by increasing the pressure. You know, in a diesel engine, the pressure of the liquid when you inject it can be of the order of 1,500 bars. And in the old days, it was much less than that. And though if you have seen an old diesel engine, an old diesel car, if you're following it, for example, you get this black smoke out of it. 
And uh, this was completely suppressed because they were starting to use these atomization systems at high pressure. In terms of science, it means we have a new problem now. We need to handle combustion and droplets. Now, droplets are very interesting animals. They don't necessarily follow the gas. If the drops are very small, they will follow the gas. But if you have a big drop, then it will go away at once. This is an example of a simulation here by Vincent Moreau a few years ago. He's injecting here droplets in a gas where you have a recirculating zone here. And you will see the trajectory of the droplets is, a, is an interesting one. You see the droplets here, they come into the chamber, then they go backwards, and then they are convected away in this zone here. And at, at the same time they do that, they evaporate. And so if you need to predict combustion now, you have to care also about the droplets. And that's a very active field of investigation at the moment. This is, for example, an, uh, something which comes from a PhD thesis, which was finished this year. Those are the new systems installed, for example, at uh, SNECMA. This, so this is called multi-point injection. Instead of injecting the, the, the gas, the kerosene at one point, you inject it at many points, many smaller points, to hope that the mixing will be better. Again, the objective is to mix very fast. If you look at a flow like this, this is what you obtain. It's, a, it's basically a big mess. You have here all these small jets, which are droplet jets. They're mixed with the air. And you can see the droplets here in this chamber. The droplets, of course, are dispersed. They evaporate at the same time. We track each of these droplets, and you have to worry about its combustion. It's an interesting problem for, com for simulation. Now you see, here you get maybe two or three million droplets in this simulation. Each of these droplets here has its own problem. And if we want to understand that, we need to care about one droplet itself. This is something else we do. For example, this is one droplet, and we are tracking the flow around uh, droplets which are very close together. In certain regions, the droplets are so close together that you need to care about the interaction between the droplets. This is another aspect of combustion which makes things uh, interesting. OK, I want to talk a little bit about, about ignition. As I've said before, if you have gas and, and uh, fuel and air, it's not enough for ignition. You need to ignite things if you want it to go. In a gasoline engine, you need to ignite it at each cycle. This is why you have sparks, okay, spark plugs. Uh, in a gas turbine, of course, in a gas turbine, you ignite it only once when you start the gas turbine. Uh, then you have two ways to do that. You can ignite things by a spark, or you can ignite it by auto-ignition. What is auto-ignition? Well, it's basically the fact that you don't use a spark. You just compress the flow. If you compress it enough, the temperature will go up, and at some point, combustion will start. This is what you do in a diesel engine. In a diesel engine, there is no spark. There is just a piston going up, up, up. At some point, the pressure is so large, then you can start having combustion without any uh, spark. Uh, ignition is a big problem. Uh, of course, e well, most of your cars now today, they start. You know, but 20 years ago, in the, during the winter, you would start the car, and it just would not start. Um, so these problems are fixed. But if you think about aircraft, uh, igniting an aircraft engine is not a big problem. The problem for an aircraft engine is to reignite it. What do we call reignition? It's a very important part of the design of an aircraft engine. Reignition is that you're flying, and suddenly the engines stop. You like it would be a good idea if you would be able to restart them, okay, in a finite time. Let's say a time which is shorter than the time it takes to go down. And uh, this happens, you know. Uh, it happens. You have seen with talking about volcanoes, for example. There were a few examples of uh, engines, even 747, for example. Not this year, but a long time ago. Uh, 747 lost the four engines at the same time. Because the problem is the volcano is not really the ashes. It's the fact that there is no oxygen there. If there is no oxygen, while well, combustion stops, you need oxygen. The four engines stop, and then you need to ignite them. We ignite them. The problem is that you are very high. The pressure is low. The temperature is low. The, the, the reignition is very difficult. And this is the way you design your combustion chamber. The first criterion in an aircraft engine is that you must be able to ignite it again. In a civil aircraft, in a fighter, it's not a problem. You can, the fighter engines are such that the reignition is almost impossible. So the pilot just uh, pulls the, the trick and it goes out. It's too late for the plane. Now, of course, ignition is not only uh, having ignition. It's also about avoiding ignition. If you talk about safety, uh, a major problem quite often in safety is that uh, uh, people are working, for example, at NSET. You know, they are working redoing the buildings, and suddenly they hit 
a gas line and you get a leak of uh, gas into the air. Now the problem is, should we ignite it? Shouldn't we ignite it? Where should we be? If, you, if there is someone smoking there, is it dangerous or not? So uh, in terms of safety, ignition is also very important. So this is just an example of combustion here in the lab again, in the laboratory. You get walls here. Here you are injecting air and fuel. I just want to show you how these things are ignited in practice. So this one is first the ignited view. You can hear the noise of these things as always. And this thing is ignited, it's blue, you see the flames, normal condition. How do you ignite that? Well, to ignite it, you use the spark. The spark is located here, you have only the air. One spark, two spark, third spark, no ignition. And then it goes. Now, the characteristic of uh, ignition in the system is that it does not happen at the first spark. Usually it takes a few sparks before it really starts going. Now you don't need to go to uh, an experiment like this. If you want to study that, you can do it at home. Okay? Uh, a system like this one to prepare your coffee is also an interesting problem where combustion has to propagate from one side to the other here. And in, even in terms of combustion science, it's not always obvious. Actually, some of you may have problems. Some mornings, you know, these things don't ignite. You don't know why. It's enough, for example, if you have a dirty hole here well, combustion will not be able to, to jump from here to there, and the whole system does not work. It can actually be dangerous if you have an old system, because then you have gas coming out of here, not burning, and of course, this gas will burn at some point later, and you don't always know where. <coughs> 